Billy Burley. It's a big topic today that's got me pretty keyed up. If you follow me on Twitter, you know that already. I want to do a thorough discussion here on the pod about where healthcare in this country is going, or about as thorough a discussion as we can have in an hour. So I want to get right to our guests who are astonishing. Dr. Danielle Martin has been with us here once before, helping us get some clarity in the early days of the pandemic. She is a professor and chair of the Department of Family and Community Medicine to Meriti Faculty of Medicine at the University of Toronto. Dr. Martin also holds a master's from the School of Public Policy and Governance at University of Toronto. Her policy, clinical and academic expertise, combined with her commitment to health equity, has made her a highly regarded health system leader here in Canada. Delighted she's here. And Professor Greg Marshallton, He's the Ontario Research Chair in Health Policy and System Design at the University of Toronto Institute of Health Policy, Management and Evaluation. Greg has also been a noted public servant and the Executive Director of the Royal Commission on the Future of Healthcare in Canada and author of the Romano Report. He was appointed to the Order of Canada last year and I know him, of course, as an articling student at the flourishing Regina law firm of Gates and Hurley. Um, so today... A solutions-oriented conversation on the health of our healthcare system. For-profit delivery, does it help? What should its role be? How much money is required here and why can't money alone fix the problem? What are other jurisdictions doing successfully or unsuccessfully? And what should the provinces be doing with the increase in health funding they're going to get? Dr. Martin, Professor Marshallton, thank you so much for making the time to be here on the Hurley Burley today. How are you? Thanks for having us. Looking forward to the discussion. Oh, good. Greg, you're all right. I haven't seen you in a while. Yeah, I'm great. I'm great. I'm enjoying myself. I'm mainly sitting down and uh, for the past two years writing a book on the history of Medicare. So, wow, uh, that's all I'm doing these days. Okay, well, giving a lot of thought to to these issues. So, so let's get right to them um, because there seems to be a consensus in the country that the healthcare system is in crisis and that things need to change. So I want to talk to you today about solutions, both real and illusory solutions. But before we can do that, we need a diagnosis. Danielle, why is our healthcare system in crisis? Well, I think, you know, uh, collective amnesia may have set in because um, we're coming out of three years of just being absolutely battered by a global public health emergency. And if you look around the world, there's not a system that isn't reeling from the effects of, uh, of COVID-19 and of the choices that we made over the course of the pandemic, uh, you know, doing the best we could at the time. And now, um, uh, and now we're, we're coming to terms with the, with the costs of those. And in fact, we, these are highly predictable. So um, if you look at, you know, uh, Emmanuel Macron in France has declared that uh, he's headed for a total overhaul of the French healthcare system. The NHS nurses are going on strike in the UK. There's, uh, I was listening to a podcast last night about uh, things uh, so, so, so bad in US emergency departments and wait times so long that a charge nurse called 911 from the emergency room to ask a, a, a group of paramedics if they could come in and lend a hand uh, to try to deal with the overflow of people in the emergency department. And she only had two nurses working that night. So this is predictable. And that doesn't mean that it's not hard. But the reason that we find ourselves in the situation that we are in, and it does, I confess, feel like a crisis. It feels like a crisis to patients and it uh, to many of us working in the system, it feels like a crisis as providers. Uh, a lot of it dates back to, to pre-pandemic stresses that the system was experiencing and the, uh, and the pandemic has now cracked those cracks wide open. And, uh, and I think we're gonna be uh, working really hard for quite some time to try to stitch things back together, but it is not a Canadian phenomenon and it is not an unexpected one. Greg, what's your take? Well, uh, I'll say it's deja vu all over again, uh, but for a different reason. Uh, we have had periodic uh, periods where everything is described as in crisis largely because it happens to coincide with the time for a premier's ask for an increase, major increase in the Canada health transfer. And the timing is not accidental. Uh, 
But we've been through this many, many, many times, as you know. And part of the problem is that um, ever since we moved from shared cost financing back in the 1970s to a system of annual transfers, which was in a sense set by the federal government, uh, not based upon sharing expenditures on Medicare with the provinces, but basically uh, based upon a whole host of factors, including the federal government's own fiscal situation uh, and the demands of the premiers. Uh, we have had these periodic uh, bouts of, I'll call them fabricated crisis. And this has to do with the nature of the financing system. And I'll just quickly summarize what I mean by that. The Canada Health Transfer flows directly into the general revenue funds of the provinces. And as you know, some provinces have recently provided either uh, tax um, benefits or tax uh, rebates to their residents. And of course, provinces have as much desire as possible to ensure that they can get as much money through the Canada Health Transfer into their general revenue fund because it gives them all kinds of flexibility. Now, they're going to use a lot of that money for health care, but they don't have to use all of it for health care. There's no way of tracking it once it enters into the general revenue fund. It's then decided at the level of Treasury Board and the Cabinet as a whole, how that money is distributed in the government. So adding more and more money to the Canada health transfer doesn't uh, guarantee that that money is going to be used in health care, first of all. And second of all, much more importantly, there's no connection between that money and the kinds of reforms, changes, innovations that we all know are needed in order to improve the delivery of health care. And so um, you can tie it to various uh, requirements, and these are stated in communiques from the first ministers, or you can even have bilateral agreements like we had back in 2017 that tie it to certain expenditures and mental health um, and other areas. But the truth of the matter is it's very, very difficult to really tie conditionality to this kind of transfer. So uh, the premiers are going to try to get as much money as they can. The federal government is going to provide an additional amount. It won't be the amount that the premiers ask, but it'll be a boost to the CHT. And the federal government uh, is going to state that its priorities are the following. Uh, and it may even be accompanied by some bilateral agreements, but there's no way of ensuring that that is going to be spent in the ways that are hoped. And it's certainly no guarantee of uh, reform in the system. Great. Danielle, I just want to come back to something before we move on. I just want to come back to you're laying this largely on COVID. But, you know, um, in 2018, well before COVID, Doug Ford was, with some success, railing about uh, hallway medicine already. Um, so there were some cracks in this before COVID, were there not? Oh, for sure. And I think, you know, the, the big change that we're seeing in uh, since the pandemic uh, that I think, uh, to, to me, is palpably different from the pre-pandemic conversation is the state of our human resources. In, in Canadian healthcare and again, all around the world. So, you know, we've seen, I mean, I'm a family physician. We've seen a doubling of retirements among family doctors in the system in the, in the first six months of the pandemic. We see huge uh, shortages of just about every uh, flavor of healthcare worker, whether it's nurses, um, radiation technologists, lab techs, um, you know, uh, um, physicians, et cetera. And uh, so we're really in a situation now. Um, and again, it's a... Can I ask you, who doesn't want a good paying, uh, guaranteed job with benefits yeah, and a defined a benefit pension plan? 
It's a great question. I mean, I think in many instances, these are folks who were kind of on the on the edge. Um, so in many cases, it's people who were planning to retire, you know, in five years and instead have decided to opt out early. Um, among doctors, um, we've seen uh, it manifest also as a change in uh, n- not whether or not they're working, but how much and what kind of work they're doing. So in family medicine, uh, that's meant an, uh, a significant departure from what we think of as family medicine, like comprehensive practice, having an office, having a group of patients who you take responsibility for and you see them on a regular basis and into more focused areas of practice. So you know, people doing solely sports medicine or solely palliative care or solely um, cosmetics or other uh, other forms of practice. And so a shift in the kind of work that they're doing, and that's left uh, many, many, many uh, Canadians without who who had a family doctor heading into uh, into the pandemic uh, now without one and with uh, therefore no anchor uh, in the in their in their health care. So we've uh, that's manifest, for example, and Stats Can has long reported that 85% of Canadians have a family doctor or a regular place of care, nurse practitioner, team, whatever. Um, a recent study that just uh, the results were just released in the last couple of days by our team at U of T says that that number is probably more like 70, 77% now. That's a massive change uh, over and a everybody short wants- of time. Everybody wants one. It's Almost the most everybody important. Wants one. It's the most important thing. I've never made a more politically popular promise in my life than when we promised in 2014 to give everybody in Ontario uh, access to a family physician because people see it as the gate through which they enter the healthcare system. They don't even know how else they would get in. Now, now, Greg, you and I both come from Saskatchewan. I had a brother-in-law who was a doctor in Kindersley, owned the clinic in Kindersley, and. You know, often as a kid, I remember going to visit him and he would be unavailable because he was on call. And so, you know, it could be the middle of the night, somebody somewhere in Kindersley gets sick, he's got to go to the hospital or to the person's house and deal with that issue. Premier Fury of Newfoundland told me last week on this show that people don't want to practice medicine like that anymore. Nobody wants that job. Well, that's uh, the practice of medicine and, and general practice, family medicine has really changed. Um, In the 1950s, doing house calls was a regular part of a a family doctor's job. And they did much more emergency work. It wasn't just uh, people just didn't go to the emergency department at a local hospital. It was often uh, the local doctor showing up. Uh, Family physicians delivered babies. They did uh, basic, basic surgery at times. um, you know, it's it's changed dramatically. And it's not that the scope of practice has changed. Legally, uh, doctors can do the same things that they did then, but it's become uh, more specialized. And certainly doctors in Canada uh, are not prepared to do the kinds of house calls that you see in countries like France, etc. And part of it is the payment system doesn't incentivize it. Uh, second of all, there's a type of payment uh, that encourages you to stay in your office. And so um, naturally, uh, it's going to encourage doctors to do that. Um, and so these these are not necessarily permanent changes, but these are trends. And they can be changed over time uh, if we decide that we're going to do that. And by saying, when I say we, I mean, it's a combination of public support uh, and governmental action in terms of changing payment systems. Cool. All right. So there is um, an idea on the table as been put forward by the Ford government. Um, and I have a strong opinion about this, but I'm prepared to be persuaded by two experts differently. So, let me listen to you. Let me hear you on this. The Ford government says that one of the solutions in uh, in Ontario is an expansion of private delivery of health care services. Um, I, um, well, let me just stop before I say anything. Um, advocates say there's already a lot of private delivery in the system, so this won't change anything. 
Is this a solution? Is this a good idea? So uh, I, th I think what we're talking about is not just private delivery, but really corporate for profit delivery. So the delivery of publicly funded services by, uh, you know, investor owned uh, shareholder driven corporations. And that's What's the other Danielle, what's a nonprofit private delivery mechanism? So non, so there's, there are nonprofit private delivery, which would be like your, your average hospital. So right. hospitals are not for profit, but they are, they, they are not run by the government. They have their own boards of directors. I'm talking about Ontario now where the Ford, uh, proposal is, is being discussed. Um, yeah. and then you've got your for-profit small business, like your family doctor or your local, you know, physiotherapist or whatever, where, uh, it's for profit in the sense that the provider is taking home some income at the end of the, at the end of the week, but they're not, uh, but they don't have shareholders, um, you know, other than maybe their spouse or something. So, you know, that's a small, a small business model, but this is we're we're talking about expansion of, uh, of, uh, the delivery of services covered by OHIP, into more corporate for profit hands. And, you know, the premier and the minister of health have repeatedly said, you won't pay with your credit card, you pay with your OHIP card. Well, that's a good start. I mean, that's about who pays. That's the, the financing of the thing. And I would say, well, even before we move to who delivers, let's just double check and dot the I's and cross the T's on that because we do care that you be able to pay with your OHIP card, not your credit card. And we know that in the corporate for profit setting, we see more upselling of services. And what I uh, have heard described very aptly as putting the OHIP service behind a paywall. So that means, for example, I won't charge you for your colonoscopy, but when you come to my private colonoscopy clinic, I will charge you for a visit with a dietitian. And you can't get the colonoscopy unless you talk to the dietitian. So that's 300 bucks. You have to pay for the dietitian consult, or I won't charge you for your cataract surgery, but uh, you, you, uh, you would have to pay for this upgraded lens, you know, uh, in case you're a fighter pilot or something, you need this, uh, this super fancy lens. Uh, and uh, that's more than the one that OHIP covers. And we just don't offer the OHIP covered lens. So you can't get your cataract done in our, in our clinic. So these forms of linking, uninsured to insured services. Uh, we've seen a lot of them in the, in the corporate for profit sector and we need to guard against. So, so let's just make sure that when we talk about the OHIP card is what pays that we really mean it and that we're being careful about regulating around all these kinds of bad behaviors. Then we want to talk about, okay, you pay with your OHIP card, who's delivering the service. It's now a corporate for profit entity. Are we automatically opposed to that? Maybe not. But you and I both want to know that the quality of the service is going to be the same, that the oversight is going to be the same. I want to know if I'm getting my hip replaced at some clinic out, outside of the hospital, that there's going to be the same quality of service provided to me, that I'm no, no more likely to get an infection. I'm no more likely to have a complication. Somebody's going to take just as good care of me in that clinic as they would if I were having my operation in the hospital. Um, and you want to be sure that they are not sucking the nurses and doctors and other healthcare workers out of the hospital to staff those facilities. So what's the plan for making sure that the there is uh, good linkages and planning around human resources across the whole of the sector? Those are the kinds of things that we have to consider if we're seriously going to uh, go down this road. Last week in this space, we were extolling the virtues of something you probably don't think about very much or at all, but has the potential to greatly impact how you go about your life. Or maybe you do spend significant time thinking about the differences in wireline cabling, and you have considered what it says about providers in this country who stake our connectivity on fast, durable fiber optic cables versus those who just double down on older, cheaper, weaker copper. In order to provide the best network resiliency and reliability, our presenting sponsor TELUS builds differently than many of their biggest competitors. Making the switch to fiber optic cables is a big part of that. Because, let's face it, rewiring the country ain't no small thing. They're 70% of the way there already, and 100% fiber optic is the goal. Last week I was talking about how fiber cable makes connectivity faster and more efficient and won't degrade like copper. So it's far more resistant to extreme weather events, which, you know, we're having a lot of these days. But there's also a sustainability story here, a hell of a persuasive one. TELUS Pure Fiber is up to 85% more energy efficient than copper, 
because it requires far less energy to send data over fiber than copper wires. Fiber optic cables are made from silicon dioxide, one of the most abundant elements on the planet. You find it in rocks and sand and water. Copper, on the other hand, is laborious. It's a finite resource that has to be mined. On that subject, it's important to know that, as part of TELUS's copper retirement program, all copper wires removed from communities will be recycled. That'll reduce future mining efforts and put less stress on the environment. All of this adds up to TELUS Pure Fiber being Canada's most sustainable internet technology, Hurley Burleyites. More reliability, more resilience, and more sustainability wound up in every single strand of it. So, Greg, Danielle's taken a, a crack at explaining this to us from her perspective. You presumably studied it with the Romano Commission and a number of other times. I don't understand what, it, I mean, Danielle partially explained it to me, but what is a business model that allows a for-profit delivery system to both be cheaper and more accessible to the public than a public system is and be profitable just on OHIP money? Well, <clears throat> Let's start with the proposition that we already have a private delivery system, specifically in Ontario, um, because other provinces, they run acute care services uh, through their uh, health agencies, whether they're regional or provincial. So Ontario is a bit of a special case. But for sure, uh, in every case, um, you can have surgeons gather together and form a professional association and provide certain select surgical services uh, to residents um, that uh, are accessed through their Medicare cards. And so what I don't understand about this is what is really meant, Danielle, spoke to it briefly, but since you can already have private for-profit professional services, what is the premier suggesting? Is he suggesting that he is going to provide government funding to get uh, corporations started and moving into the sector? Or is he going to be uh, offering additional incentives to surgeons to set up these, uh, what I'll call overnight uh, or uh, uh, day surgeries for relatively simple procedures. You'll note that this is never going to be for extremely complicated procedures that involve lengthy stays, um, but they will be for the more routine type uh, procedures. So what's he suggesting and why isn't the so-called market already being filled by, by professionals under the existing system? What, what has been preventing that from happening? There are private surgical clinics in virtually every province in the country, uh, but they operate strictly under Medicare rules, uh, and they don't provide uh, certain... Um, um, what I will call preferential access privileges to certain uh, individuals. With the but that's exception, probably not very interesting to shoppers, Drug Mart. Uh, no, it's not going to be ever interesting to a shareholder held corporation. Um, they've got to figure out a way to generate, a, you know, a pretty high rate of return so that their shareholders can take some of that return. Second of all. Uh, they're going to be operating on a much larger scale. And so you need to look at other countries to see what's going on. Uh, for example, the United States um, and a few other countries. But the, the, the main places where you have this corporatization of surgical services tends not to be in countries with universal health coverage. It tends to be in countries with partial coverage, and therefore you have these huge gaps, and they get filled by the, the, by the private what I'll call commercial sector at times. The Saskatchewan government, Danielle, brought in this MRI system where you could, where there's private clinics, and the private clinics are allowed to do a certain number of private paid procedures uh, as long as they do a, an equivalent number of publicly paid procedures. 
I had trouble explaining to people in Saskatchewan why that was bad for Medicare and ultimately bad for them. What would you say about that? Well, I think, I mean, a few things. The first is we just want to make sure that the person who's getting the next scan is the one who needs it the most. That's the whole premise of our entire healthcare system. If you let go of that premise, everything falls apart. And, uh, and so, you know, uh, when you could, when you clog up the system with uh, people who are purchasing their scan, who may or may not need the scan, may or, you know, may not be an appropriate scan, you're, you're uh, rarely are you increasing the total volume of, uh, of things going on. You're usually just pushing the other ones further down the list. But, you know, in Ontario, it, it's even more um, complicated because we have so many scanners and, you know, we have such a big population. Uh, I, I work in downtown Toronto. There's a, you know, an M, the number of MRI magnets up and down University Avenue alone um, is quite substantial. And most of those scanners are not running 24-7 already. Why? Because we don't have the staff to run them. And so, you know, we can, we can allow a, a, a private uh, clinic to purchase their own MRI and open their doors for business, but it's not going to increase the number of total MRI scans available unless we are taking staff out of the, um, you know, out of some un, unspecified reservoir uh, yet to be identified. And so uh, one of the biggest concerns that I have with respect to the scanners, because I know that that is on the list of um, of procedures potentially to be contracted out to, to for-profit clinics is aside from the human resources question um, is, are we going to be uh, actually building a system of next available appointment? So um, in let's take downtown Toronto as an example, which a lot of people live in the city of Toronto. Do you really think it matters to anyone whether they get their MRI scan done at Bathurst and Dundas or at College and Bay, you know, three subway stops away? But those two scanners have completely separate waiting lists. And you can, in fact, many people are on both waiting lists. So we actually have no idea how long the true wait time is uh, for an MRI because so many people are on more than one list at once. If we're going to open up to uh, to additional scanners and somehow find the capacity to increase the total total pool of uh, of MRIs to be done, we'd better make sure that there's a single list and that the next patient done wherever they're being done is the one who needs it the most. So the concept of the single common cue, um, that is a, a really important principle. And coming back to what Greg was saying earlier, no federal investment is going to be linked to that level of detail. If we keep shoveling money into a system in which you've got six MRIs and separate six separate waiting lists or 20 orthopedic surgeons and 20 wait lists for hip and knee replacement, uh, you're going to end up with more crazy, uh, which is what we have right now, a completely disjointed system in which it's almost impossible to figure out how to get things for people. If, if we link the investments, federal or otherwise, to a reorganizing of the delivery system into something that is rational and makes sense, then we might actually start to see wait times go down. And, and that's an area where the provinces have complete control and jurisdiction and the responsibility. They, they, they don't need to wait for a negotiation with the federal government to make these kinds of decisions. They should be making them all the time. And the only Are they innovating all the time, Greg? Like, I just assume that there's people be. running these provinces that are trying to deliver good service to their people and keep costs uh, con under control. Aren't they looking at global examples all the time or what's working in other jurisdictions? I mean, presumably, they're not a bunch of adults. They're trying to do a good job. Exactly. You know, I think the, the issue here is that that's exactly what they're trying to do. But when you actually look at the ministries of health, province by province, uh, you will see that they are not able to spend as much effort and focus on what I would call innovation as they should, nor do they have the time to be looking at the kinds of best practices internationally that they should to be able to uh, generate new ideas and how things could be done. Second of all, there's often a great um, sort of tendency to caution because they don't want to upset the political apple cart in the sense that 
they they feel that their political masters uh, appetite for change is limited and so there's not a lot of change being proposed even when they know that there are things that could be done but they require pretty major changes in the delivery system and in relations with the providers and their organizations. And that's what creates the political risk for, for provincial governments. And but you know, absolutely. I agree ahead. with you, Greg. I totally agree with you. And you know, one of the things that we saw in the in the pandemic was a lifting of that caution in a way that I have to say was quite inspiring and refreshing, you know, uh, a willingness to take risks an understanding that not every decision that got made was going to turn out in retrospect to have been the right one, but you were going to make the decisions that had to be made with the information you had and uh, a, a lifting of the terror of, um, of innovation because it was so clear that we were not going to be able to respond to this threat unless we tried doing some stuff that was new. And uh, so a small but important example was virtual care, you know, and the way in which overnight we moved from, you know, not being able to, to, uh, to, to really get very much virtual care in the healthcare system at all to the mass delivery of virtual care services across every aspect of the healthcare system and including some stuff that has, has proved to be quite effective in the realm of mental health um, and o- an opening up of services uh, funded by provincial plans, whether it's internet-based cognitive behavioral therapy or what have you, that I think will stand the test of time. And now we're going to kind of take stock and realize, okay, well, Obviously, some things have to be done in person, some things, um, you know, uh, some kinds of virtual care should probably not happen. Some kinds of virtual care are only worth doing if it's within the confines of an ongoing relationship with your doctor, not like a one-off, you know, visit on an app. But like, good for us that we finally broke through that barrier. That's an example of innovation that um, that the pandemic, uh, you know, kind of allowed us to change the ground rules in a, in a rapid way. And I think, and there are many more examples like that. So I do think there's innovation happening all the time, but it's the scale up of it because of what you've articulated, Greg, that, that fear, that caution of, you know, well, what if it turns out to have been wrong or what if it turns out that we wasted money or what if it turns out, I mean, yes, those are risks, but you make the best decisions that you can trying to make things better for people. And then you live with the consequences. Otherwise, you just end up with the same thing over and over again. Well, I I, I also hope that it uh, doesn't require a hugely disruptive crisis to encourage that kind of innovation. And there are two sort of uh, levels that it occurs at. One is, of course, within the ministries of health responsible for long-term planning and for uh, longer-term changes. But the other is at the level of the... Uh, health regions and provincial health agencies and the uh, kinds of facilities that they run. And, and they're, I mean, it's very open to them to be able to experiment and make uh, changes when they want. And I would hope that this is going on all of the time, but you can see that it doesn't go on all the time. And you can see that there are differences among jurisdictions. And virtual care is actually a very good example of that. And I'll get beyond uh, virtual care being defined as telephone consults between physicians and patients, which was the main area of, of virtual care. But talk about the uh, virtual care that was going on by certain companies uh, that uh, – that some provinces rejected entirely because they didn't want to their Medicare system to be built for those services, even though people couldn't get family doctors, uh, they couldn't get mental health treatments. So they began to resort and pay out of pocket for these services. They were being delivered by companies um, across the country, often with providers located outside their province. Other provinces decided to negotiate with these uh, companies to try to incorporate them into Medicare, and that actually produced a very good result. Now, some of these are the large corporations that are questionable in terms of the value that you get, but you could very much see how professional associations that are uh, for-profit but are 
really uh, consigned and, and confined to professionals themselves as opposed to corporations could operate within this environment. Second of all, you can see that we've outgrown, I think, a system in which uh, all the providers need to come from the very province in which the resident is located to get care. We need to think about this in a broader way and that it is uh, it would be a good idea for service to be provided, for example, by a group of physicians located in Ontario for residents in New Brunswick who can't get a family doctor. So there's this Canadian documentary on the Discovery Channel called Highway Through Hell. It follows a BC company that specializes in rescuing really big trucks and other heavy vehicles that are overwhelmed by the ferocious environment of BC's interior. Mudslides, washouts, lethal drop-offs, avalanches, rock falls, that sort of thing. The heroes of Highway Through Hell recover giant rigs that have plunged off precipices or drag marooned excavators out of peat bogs or haul some behemoth out of a sea of mud. What viewers may not notice, though, is what goes on in the background. As the wrecking crews struggle with their Sisyphean tasks along the highway through hell, from time to time, a train slides smoothly from one side of the frame to the other, behind them, either heading for or out of Vancouver. The fact is, trains have been navigating the BC interior for more than a century. Railways know the terrain and weather better than anyone. Our sponsor, CN, has an entire force of engineers and other specialists whose job is to keep trains running. Unlike the highway through hell crews, though, they specialize in ensuring disasters are cleared before trains roll through. Their ability to respond when nature's hammer falls is remarkable. And then there's just common sense. CN and its main competitor compete, to be sure, but sometimes they cooperate in harsh environments, sharing tracks and even trains. In the Fraser Canyon, both CN and CP trains use each other's tracks on either side of the river to ensure smooth flow of cargo and on-time delivery. And that's just one example. Hauling cargo through wilderness can be hairy. And when there is a business case for cooperation between railways, it happens, as it must. That, though, is a much different thing than regulated cooperation imposed by government. CN knows its business better than anyone. Left to its own ends, it moves Canada's economy on time and safely. So you talk about these kinds of utilities, and these kinds of changes. I mean, when I go on my 70s Saskatchewan-based pro-Medicare rant with my friends, they often tell me that I'm too ideological, I'm hidebound by the past, and that one of the things they always say to me is the United States is not the only comparison to make, that Europe has all kinds of mixes of pay and don't pay and private and public, and it all works out. It's got high degrees of equity for people, and it's much more effective and efficient, and we should be modeling ourselves after Europe. Is that true? Well, you know what I always say is you can't put a Big Mac on a baguette and call it French food. So careful. <laughs> careful about trying to think that we can import some small aspect of a European health system into a country that borders the largest, uh, most wasteful, most inequitable health system in the world uh, and, where, and where we are bound by free trade agreements all up and down that border. Um, you know, we have to be very thoughtful about uh, about where we where we move um, in Canada because we do um, a compete with provide with the U.S. for providers, um, and you know we know that there's labor that moves in both directions across the border all the time. And b once we once we bring in corporatization of Canadian healthcare, we won't have a leg to stand on to prevent. Um, the actual American corporations from coming in and, and uh, participating in the system. And that's not, um, you know, fear mongering. That's an accurate assessment of our, uh, of our free trade agreements um, with, uh, with our biggest trading partner. But I do think that it is of course true that we should be learning from other health systems all the time. So let's look at what other health systems that perform well do for people. The first thing that they do is they cover everybody. We do that in Canada for doctors and hospitals, but we don't do it for pharmaceuticals. 
We don't do it for mental health services. So we have a woefully behind the times health system when you think about what we include in the Medicare basket. What else do those high-performing systems do? They ground everything in high-performing, easy to access, close to home, family medicine and primary care. We've talked about that already, but like it, it, it cannot be overstated the importance of making sure that we deal with that. And none of that should be you know, behind any kind of a payment, uh, uh, any kind of a payment barrier. Um, and, and then they make sure that no one is cherry picking or skimming the easy cases out or, um, you know, engaging in shenanigans. And in fact, in many of these systems, physicians are employees of the, of the health system. Uh, and uh, and they make a lot less money than Canadian physicians do. So these are like really really important differences. And my and my point is simply that you know of course we can be learning all the time from other systems, but we are existing in a particular kind of context here, and we cannot uh, pretend that you can kind of transplant one little aspect of another country's healthcare service and get the same effect here in in Canada. Greg, is there a silver bullet in Norway for us? Well, you know, <laughs> when when I, I, I started out talking about sort of the macro, meso, and micro levels of financing, and, and the same thing applies to regulation and governance, you can't just incorporate one aspect of sort of that macro environment uh, to, uh, to, to a country like Canada and vice versa. Uh, they can't incorporate Canada's system there uh, at that level. But what we can do is we can learn in terms of the delivery aspects, the micro dimensions. And what happens in this debate concerning Europe is that, and uh, I mean, Danielle's already used the term cherry picking. They cherry pick a particular dimension of that system where there's, let's say, the ability for doctors to pri uh, practice public medicine during the day and private medicine in the evening type of thing. But they do it in the wrong context because that's a system where all of the hospital physicians, for example, are public employees. They're salaried. And so the government is allowing them in their spare time to work on fee-for-service for uh, private providers. But in the Canadian context, all of the physicians virtually that work within our hospitals are private contractors. So it doesn't make sense in this context. And you need greater protections in our system. They're not really independent contractors, though. I mean, shouldn't they really be qualified as employees? I mean, they're no more independent contractors than delivery people for Pizza Nova. Or, oh, believe uh, me, believe me. As a former, as a former hospital executive, I can assure you, <laughs> I was not the boss of the doctors in my hospital. You know, I could not tell them what you know what time their uh, what time their shift started and ended, whether or not they were allowed to take vacation. We were not providing them with benefits or a pension, um, and uh, and they had you know they had autonomy. Now we have control over the resources, so I can say, well, we don't. You know, there's. The OR starts at eight. Right. <laughs> would you Would you like to be there, Mister Surgeon, or uh, whatever? But I, but it's not. Uh, it, it's not an employment relationship. But they can't and have a second client. They can only it, have one client. Correct. They can only right. have one. Well, they can have if you know. Yes, they can only bill the public plan. Uh, and or they can, uh, you know, in some instances they can bill the patient, but they can't bill the patient more than the public plan would pay them. And so it, it is there are limits on their behavior. There are limits on physician behavior in every health system. Um, but I but but for sure, I mean, one of the, the greatest challenges, again, for better or for worse, uh, one of the greatest challenges in, for example, you think about the single common queue. Seems pretty logical, right? I mean, would, wouldn't you want to have, uh, like they have this in uh, in Winnipeg for colonoscopies, one waiting list. Your number comes up, you go, you go to, you know, anywhere in the Winnipeg re region and you get your, the next available colonoscopy. Well, we can't force doctors to participate in such a, a, a plan. We have to entice them, exhort them, ask nicely, pay them more, et cetera, to participate in a single common queue system because they own their own wait list and nobody is the boss of them. So, you know, that's, it's all very well and good when everyone's interests are aligned, 
Uh, but in order to, uh, one of the biggest challenges in Canadian healthcare is trying to find ways to support physicians to participate in these kinds of uh, mechanisms when in fact they're not required to do so. And it's entirely up to them whether or not they're going to participate. And I'll only add that they have options. Uh, they can move to another country. Their skills are in demand. There's a, a, a shortage in many countries right now. Second of all, they can go to a large center and join a, a group of private practicing uh, physicians because, after all, they all have a right to opt out of Medicare. No one has, as long as any Canadian resident that they charge, uh, they they that has to be paid out of pocket by the individual, but they live off workers' compensation. Uh, uh, they live off sports teams and various other groups. They live off people who are visiting the country. Uh, and these are viable businesses and they exist and there's no prohibition on that kind of private opted out practice in the country. So Greg, at the risk of uh, triggering some PTSD with you, um, what is the thing from the Romano Commission that you most wished would have happened that didn't? I wish that universal uh, health coverage had been extended, and we made a recommendation in two areas in the immediate term. One was uh, med what we call medically necessary home care as a first step. And it was in three areas, uh, mental health, uh, palliative, and uh, a third area. We also uh, recommended that a certain amount of drug coverage, what we call catastrophic drug coverage, come under universal health coverage as a platform to move to full outpatient prescription drug coverage in a few years. Neither of those recommendations were taken up. And as you know, in 2004, rather than tying the expansion of coverage to a huge increase uh, in the transfer, uh, there were other requirements, but not that. And uh, unfortunately, I think that was a historic opportunity that we missed. And what difference would that make? Like if we talk about a system in crisis right now, mm -hmm. what difference would that have made? Well, it would have made it much more rational in certain areas. Uh, it would have uh, also uh, saved governments a lot of money by this time uh, after it had been implemented because provincial governments would not have been under nearly the same stress. Because right now, uh, basically, they pay entirely out of their own source revenues, home care services, and any safety net packages that they have for prescription drugs, the provincial drug plants. They are very expensive programs, particularly the prescription drug programs. If this had been done, we would have ended up with a pan-Canadian program. We would have been able to bring down the prices of the drugs through more effective regulation. Uh, and this would have freed up money for provinces to be able to move on other areas and really do, uh, you know, uh, some very much needed reforms. And one example of that is long-term care. Long-term care became like the weak sister, has been the weak sister in provincial health ministry planning for decades. Uh, it was a disaster. Waiting you know, for a happen. brief moment, we had to pay attention to it, and we were all horrified and appalled. And now it appears to me as if we've all forgotten that ever yep. happened. Exactly, exactly. And, and once again, there's going to be no emphasis on it. But if you go to a country like the Netherlands and you tour a long-term care facility uh, for the cognitively impaired, you will see it's fundamentally different than anything that we have in Canada. It's expensive, but it's really e effective. And actually, it's less expensive in the, in the long run uh, because you're dealing much more effectively with that population. And, and in Canada, we, we mix, of course, the cognitive and physical uh, disability. Um, and at one time, that might not have been a problem because only 10% of your long-term care population uh, had cognitive uh, difficulties. Now, 50% have serious dementia-related dementia, dementia -related conditions in long-term care. That's part of it is that we're living longer 
And while we can push off physical disability, we can't really push off this cognitive disability. So we just have this much higher rate. And we have long-term care facilities and personnel that were equipped to deal with a different problem in a different generation. And, and we're not coping very well with this. That's super interesting. Thanks for that. Can I talk about money? Mm-hmm. Can I talk about money? So these discussions always focus on money between the two levels of government. But if I hear anything more religiously than this, I don't know. Money won't solve the problem. Money alone will not solve the problem. Everybody says this. Can I ask you why that would be uh, the case? Like, at, just at some 30,000-foot level, it seems to me like we have been discussing for decades the impact of this baby boom generation on every aspect of our society. And as it has moved through every wave of society, it's had a huge impact, this outsized demographic core, which now is, I'm at the tail end of it, so let's say 60, people between 60 and 80 right now. Um, It doesn't strike me unusual that as that large cohort ages, it starts to cost the healthcare system a lot of money and starts to burden the healthcare system. But it also is not a permanent problem. It's a 20-year problem. So why wouldn't we be prepared to just ride that out? Greg, you want to take this first? Well, first of all, I'd say that when you look at that demographic bubble, Canada's not at the high end of it in terms of comparing to other countries in Western Europe and Japan. Part of it's our high rate of immigration and the age uh, demographic of of immigrants. So uh, we really uh, do not face the kind of challenge that, for example, is faced in Japan on this issue. Second, that uh, we're bound to have uh, a uh, more expensive uh, system, if you like, uh, and more expensive um, uh, requirements because of that bubble, no matter where we sit relative to other countries. And so it makes sense that we're going to spend a bit more, but it's not it's not so much that you're spending more period once you a uh, person uh, sort of uh, is past a certain age. It's more like the expenditure in the last six months of life or the last nine months of life. That's where it's concentrated. Oh, fair enough. But I go to the doctor more now than I did when I was 18 years old. We all do. We all do. But this is nothing compared to the burden you will be potentially in the last six to nine months of your life. Nothing. So that's what you have to... And it's astonishing, and it, given the burden I am now to the people close to me. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I think the other thing is that uh, what we've seen with prior investments where, uh, and, you know, this is a Romano uh, term for all I know, Greg coined it, this notion of buying change, you know, yeah. that if we're going to... And so we've got to invest. Let's just accept we're going to have to spend some more money on health care uh, you know, fair enough. But if we don't use that money to spark um, some uh, of the reforms that we've been talking about, uh, whether that's team-based primary care, whether it's, you know, uh, alignment of specialty services, whether it's appropriate incorporation of virtual care, whether it's expansion to pharma care and, uh, you know, uh, improvement of long-term care, like all of this stuff we've been talking about, if, if, if we just keep dumping money into the system without requiring that it be used to buy change, then we will end up with, you know, and I had to go to school to learn this uh, formula they didn't teach you in medicine called cost equals price times volume. And what happens if you're not careful is you invest money and all you do is end up paying higher prices for the same services that you've been providing. So if you don't figure out a way to uh, manipulate the volume side of the, you know part of that equation, meaning improving access for people or some different kind of service, then you're just going to end up with exactly the same thing that you're getting, but at a higher price point. And, and that uh, really comes down to, dare I say it, 
the salaries of the people working in the system. And we may be totally, we may say like, we think nurses should earn more money. I'm for that. You know, maybe we think doctors should earn more money too. We could have that conversation, but I would like to see us talking about how do we, uh, how do we get people working differently as opposed to just paying a, a higher price point for the same services that we've been getting. And there is a history of that in Canada investments basically flowing through the system to end up with higher remuneration for well, no that's what difference. people say happened to the Martin money. That's that's what they say. And there's some evidence to support it. Right. Yeah, it is. And it's also the case that happened in the Blair government in, um, in Britain uh, after 30 uh, years, over three decades of underinvestment in the NHS, all of a sudden they just put a huge amount of money into the NHS and a lot of that went into provider salaries. But there it was justified to some extent because those providers were underpaid in terms of the rest of the of the continent. And second of all, uh, that it was needed in order to attract people, um, uh, you know, new medical students, new nurses, et cetera, into the system. And that did not prove quality, but they also attach conditions and they set targets and they required some change that did occur. And the NHS actually improved quite dramatically through the 1990s and into the early 2000s. And the Commonwealth Fund out of New York still ranks it as one of the best health systems in the world based upon largely patient satisfaction surveys. Uh, not doctor satisfaction surveys, because a lot of those changes doctors were very unhappy about, particularly target setting. I mean, as I understand the laws of supply and demand, aren't nurses telling us they need to make more money with their feet? Yeah, and they may well need to, although I will say, and we know this from, you know, uh, from, uh, from physician work as well, some forms of work, there, you actually can't pay people enough to do. So you you do actually, we do actually have to pay attention to the environment that we are putting people into. Um, uh, you know, we've seen this in for decades and in, in terms of attracting healthcare workers to rural um, and remote communities. You know, you can keep um, paying doctors more and more and more to, to work in, uh, in uh, remote communities, but unless you, you, surround them with colleagues and, you know, an appropriate uh, capacity for work-life balance and somebody to cover them so they can take a vacation and, um, you know, a job for their spouse or whatever, then you're not going to retain them in those communities. And so like the, the notion of, of paying attention solely to how much money we're paying people and not to the, the environment that they're working in um, is a dangerous one as well, which is not to say that we don't need to pay some people more to do some kinds of work in the health system. I think absolutely we do, but we've got to be thoughtful about that. Hey, I, I have saw, a friend. Uh, oh, go ahead. Go uh, ahead. Greg. I, I was yeah. just going to say, I saw a very, very uh, great experiment in Quebec uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. There was a shortage, a terrible shortage of personal support workers in long-term care facilities. So, the government created a program uh, that basically provided uh, training for new uh, personal support workers. Uh, it uh, expanded the, the the sort of seats in the program immediately and provided them with bursaries uh, so that they could live while taking their education. And they paid personal support workers more uh, as well. And that was it, it, it changed the picture in Quebec uh, within a year. And all of a sudden, uh, you had a whole bunch of new entrants into this field. Now, was it sustained? Hopefully, eventually, the army will be able to leave then. Well, <laughs> I mean, when the army arrived uh, and, and was dealing with them, both in Ontario and Quebec, the program wasn't yet spitting out personal support workers um, to replace the ones that had, were, were exiting. So it's not just a matter of money. It's not just a matter of supply. You've got to change the working conditions. And that's what takes time, right? Uh, and some of those working conditions were absolutely horrible, as we know from the reports that the military provided. Hey, I've got a friend named Peter Nicholson, and he's a really smart guy. And he wrote a paper for the Johnson Shoyama School of Public Policy at the University of Regina, in which he said, 
Let's end this kabuki theater of federal provincial negotiations over health care. The feds add no value uh, to the delivery of health care. Let's put the provinces on the hook for it and give them no cover to hide behind. Get The feds get out of the financial transfer business. They transfer the tax points to the provinces required to fund health care, and then it's up to the provinces. And there's no more account- diffusity of accountability. Everybody knows whose job it is to run the health care system, and that's it. Well, um, Peter, Peter was remembering what Mitchell Sharp did in 1966 as finance minister. He made the same proposal at that time. Okay. Exactly the same proposal. And Andrew Coyne made it in my newspaper uh, just this past weekend, too. Because he so, had read uh, Peter. Old is new again. Because he had read <laughs> Peter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but it is, you know, it would, it, you know, we could and should have that conversation because there is an accountability problem with the current system. But it's not all a problem with the provinces. There's also a problem with the federal government and all of this. Uh, And so we should have the conversation. But the difficulty here is that there's no way to enforce any pan-Canadian standards. This is a Canadian program, Greg. This is not a Manitoba program or an Ontario program. Canadians understand this as core and definitional to the country. Yeah. Wouldn't I miss the Canada Health Act if it was not? yeah, you you know you might not need uh, the full amount that's in the Canada Health Transfer, but you need something to ensure that there's going to be uh, compliance with the five criteria of the Canada Health Act. Uh, and without that, you can't enforce it. Now, you also need political will to enforce. And we've had lots of instances, despite all of the money flowing through the Canada Health Transfer, of a lack of enforceability. And, uh, I mean, huge damage done to the principle of universality, to accessibility, and to even to, a port- and to a portability, those basic principles. And so I think that it's a double whammy there. But I know that this has been proposed many times in the past. The idea being that, well, you know, it shouldn't be up to the federal government to impose such national criteria on the Canadian people. But what's forgotten is that it was Canadians themselves that demanded and wanted that. I think that's right. And honestly, I mean, again, this the, the, this uh, amnesia of, re- of recent events is fascinating to me. Like, where where do we, how do we think we would have gotten the ventilators that we needed? How do we think we would have gotten the vaccine approvals that we needed? How do we think that we would have gotten the uh, recommendations on uh, on who should go first, second, third for access to vaccines when supply was tight had the federal government not understood that it had a role to play uh, in the management of the public health crisis of our time uh, in, in, in COVID-19? And I just think, you know, like the federal government actually can't walk away from the health of Canadians, even if it wanted to. And so given that it can't, it might as well lean in and try to figure out what its what its role should be, not to micromanage the provinces and territories on a bunch of stuff that it doesn't know how to do, but certainly to uphold that um, that set that that national vision that you're talking about, because ultimately it is democracy at work when Canadians say they have some expectation. Um, of uh, of reasonable access that looks more or less similar across the country um, and that they view it as part of what it means as a right of residency in this country. Exactly. And it's the, it's the provincial government's role to figure out how to, how to improve and reduce wait times and wait lists. The federal government can't do anything about that. It can, it can, Nobody it, in Ottawa knows anything about that. No, <laughs> they just, it's impossible. But what they can do is they can ensure that the criteria of the Canada Health Act is adhered to, and that when you travel from one province to another, you know that you're going to be protected under that system. And unfortunately, there, there hasn't been enough enforcement so that if you are a Quebecer, for example, and you go to Saskatchewan, and you go into a doctor's office um, for some needed treatment, you're told right there and then that you have to pay up front and vice versa. And so it's, you know, we're, we're, we're actually doing damage to our system by not living up to our current 
arrangements. And that is the government of Canada's uh, responsibility. Well, Prime Minister Trudeau, giddy up. Um, so I'm, I'm on the verge of abusing your time. Can I ask you one last question? Despite Peter Nicholson's pleas, the federal government's going to transfer a whack of new money to the provinces sometime in the next month or so. What should the provincial governments do with that money? Primary care teams. We have we have got we've you know if if it is the case that that access to a family doctor or primary care close to home is the foundation of everything, and we know we will not have enough family doctors to meet the needs of Canadians. The answer is teams, and they need to be implemented across the country, stat, so that everyone can be within 30 minutes, whether that's 30 minutes driving in a rural community or 30 minutes on the streetcar if you're in uh, in downtown Toronto, 30 minutes of a person or a place where you are known, where your history is clocked over time, where you have a relationship, um, and that is your entry point into the rest of the system. If we don't do that, it actually, in my opinion, does not matter what else we do. We will not have a well-functioning healthcare system if we don't do that. Uh, I, I think I have a somewhat different perspective on this because I saw in the 2003 and the 2004 agreements, communiques, where uh, the provinces had committed based upon the negotiation for increased transfers, 24-7 uh, care, uh, primary care, uh, had promised to move to teams, had promised to alter uh, practice and and it didn't really change the dynamic very much. So I don't know how the, uh, I, I'm trying to figure out the leverage of the federal government and such a thing. And, and what's the best tool? And I've now come to the conclusion that the best tool is to extract as much possible in terms of transparency and data and information. And, to ensure that this is not just information that flows from the provincial and territorial governments to Ottawa, but this is information that's made available to the public. So that the public has a way of assessing uh, their own governments and the performance of their health systems. And there could be a particular emphasis made on primary care, as Danielle suggests, in terms of the information that needs to be in a sense, uh, provided, but also what the standard should be, sort of a statement, a general statement of what we need, not necessarily how we're going to do it, but why we need to do it and what we're trying to get at the end of the day and how we should judge ourselves in terms of getting there. And then provinces still have the right to decide how best to transform primary care, but if they don't transform it, they're going to be very visible to everybody, including their own electorates. And I think that that, uh, as, that might sound too weak, but the, the information requirements have been largely lacking in these agreements. And I think that that's the, the uh, one thing that the federal government could bring to the table. And I think that Canadians would find that a very, very reasonable request. Well, thank you. Thank you both. What a wealth of information uh, this hour has provided. Uh, I'm a whole lot better informed, and I hear you loud and clear. Primary care um, is uh, the place where we need to really uh, get a fix. And I don't really hear uh, much talk about that. So I think that that's really important to have put on the table. Um, thank you both for your time. I know you're super busy, both of you, and uh, I know you rearranged plans to be here. I really appreciate it because I wanted to get this on while people are still thinking about this and before all the milk was all sour on the floor <laughs> already. Um, I want to thank our presenting sponsor, TELUS, and our sponsor, CN Rail. I'd like to thank everybody who watched or listened today, and particularly Greg and Danielle. And uh, Greg, I'll give a shout out to my brother for you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Bob. All right, take care of yourselves. Have a great day. Bye. Bye-bye. Hurley, hurley. Hurley, hurley.